Recently, Kennedy Mitchum, a graduate of America's Drake University, was embroiled in a controversy with the editors of Merriam-Webster's Dictionary over its definition of racism. Racism is not only prejudice against a certain person due to the colour of a person's skin, as it states in your dictionary, emailed Mitchum. It is both prejudice combined with social and institutional power. It is a system of advantage based on skin colour. What Mitchum's tweet reminds us is that all meanings are fluid and contested, and the meaning of racism especially so. The word racism has had a particularly bumpy journey since it was first used in the 1890s as a description of the study of race, only acquiring today's pejorative meanings during the 1930s. So how should we define racism? Well, before we answer, let's think about why we need a definition. We need one because, as Robert Miles put it in his groundbreaking 1989 study of racism, if racism is defined as politically or morally unacceptable, there must be a reasonable consensus about what it is. In other words, to rid the world of racism, we need to understand what it is and how it works. However, defining racism as the editors of Merriam Webster's found out is a political minefield. Everything hinges on how widely you cast your net. If racism is defined too narrowly, then forms of prejudice that would otherwise be condemned as racist can escape censure. From a logical perspective, it is obvious that arguing that certain forms of prejudice are not racism is not the same thing as excusing that prejudice. It is perfectly possible to say both this behaviour is not racist and this behaviour is evil. However, in practice, that distinction usually gets lost. However, if racism is defined too broadly, if we broaden the definition of racism to include all forms of prejudice, it soon loses its meaning as a category of analysis. Racism becomes everything and nothing, and therefore perhaps impossible to eradicate. The most salient aspect of Kennedy Mitchum's criticism of Merriam-Webster's dictionary is that racism is more than an attitude. It is more than simply a prejudice or feeling about other groups of people. If it were only an attitude, racism would not have the terrible power that it does. Racism is an ideology. In other words, it is a system of ideas, in this case about biological and cultural difference, justifying a particular social formation. In this case, uneven distribution of resources and power between groups defined as races. As we'll see, however, in the accompanying lecture, it's too simplistic to think that ideologies are conjured out of thin air to justify the power of elites. Instead, they grow out of concrete social realities, stitching together pre-existing ideas into a new pattern. The keystone of racist ideology is the idea that race exists. But what is race? Well, here we might want to interrogate one of Mitchum Kennedy's assumptions. Race is more than skin colour. It may seem strange to say, but none of the three most racist societies in history, the Nazi Reich, apartheid South Africa, or the Jim Crow American South, were, as Kennedy puts it, systems of advantage based on skin colour. They were systems of advantage based on race, but this is something different. As the racial theorists of all three societies spelled out over thousands of pages of discourse, Skin colour was seen as one possible indication of race, but it was not race itself. Those who did US history for A-level could think about the most famous legal case of the Jim Crow era, Plessy v Ferguson in 1896, in which the US Supreme Court enshrined separate but equal public facilities in federal law. The case originated when Homer Plessy was thrown off a whites-only train carriage. His lawyers argued that railroad segregation was unconstitutional, taking the case all the way to the Supreme Court. The important thing for our purposes, though, is that Homer Plessy did not have very dark skin. <laughs> 
He had one African great-grandparent and looked white. Indeed, the train company only knew that Pessy, Plessy was a quote-unquote Negro because he told them. In the Jim Crow South, one drop of African blood meant that you were designated as black and stripped of civil and political rights. The same applied in apartheid South Africa. Similarly, few would deny that the Nazis thought Jews were racially inferior, yet this had nothing to do with skin colour. If it had, Jews would not have been forced to wear yellow stars as identification. Now, if you don't believe that race is different from skin colour, take it from these 19th century white supremacists that I've come across in my research. Pause the lecture for a moment and read the quotations on the slide. Now, people who believe in race believe that humans can be divided into biological categories called races. To racists, this biological category determines the behaviour, culture and intellectual abilities of a group. Racists believe that all members of a racial group share the same traits, and these traits are fixed. Moreover, to racists, the races are not separate but equal, they can be arranged on a hierarchy. At the turn of the 20th century, this hierarchy often descended from a Caucasian or Aryan master race down to a group known as the Hottentots, the Dutch name for the Khoi Khoi people of South Africa. But does race exist? The answer is that a, as a biological category, it does not. The pioneering anthropologist Franz Boas was the first to criticise the idea that race determines behaviour. He did this during the 1890s. Almost 60 years later, in 1950, UNESCO issued a statement asserting that race was not a biological reality, but a myth. This statement summarised the findings of a special team comprised of the day's leading anthropologists, geneticists, sociologists and psychologists. Then, during the 1990s, scientists working for the Human Genome Project proved conclusively that racial categories have no basis in genetics. Gene sequencing showed that there was more genetic diversity within so-called racial groups than between them. As the author of Slicing Soup, an influential 2002 article published in Nature Biotechnology argued, humans share 99.99% of the same genes. Using genetics to define race, the author wrote, is like slicing soup. You can cut it wherever you want, but the soup stays mixed. Indeed, as Barbara Fields argues, sickle cell anemia, athletic abilities and a host of other supposedly racial traits soon break down when you actually look at them carefully. As Fields writes, among those who study the subject, who use and accept modern scientific techniques and logic, this scientific fact that race doesn't exist is as valid and true as the fact that the earth is round and revolves around the sun. Yet, as Barbara Fields' colleague Karen Fields has reflected, if you say there's no such thing as race, people will look at you and say that you're crazy. Such incredulous reactions are, in fact, evidence of the overwhelming power of racism as an ideology. The idea of race is so all-pervasive, so hegemonic, such an integral part of everyday discourse that it has become seen simply as common sense. It's telling that academics and scientists have been rubbishing race for over 100 years, but that these criticisms still haven't entered the public consciousness. As the journalist Guy Harrison wrote in 2010, One day in the 1980s, I sat in the front row in my first undergraduate anthropology class, eager to learn more about this bizarre and fascinating species I was born into. 
but I got more than I expected that day as I heard for the first time that biological races are not real. After hearing perf uh, several perfectly sensible reasons why vast biological categories don't work very well, I started to feel betrayed by my society. Why am I just hearing this now? Why didn't someone tell me this in elementary school? I never should have made it through 12 years of schooling before entering a university without ever hearing the important news that most anthropologists reject the concept of biological races. But of course there is no such thing as common sense, only dominant ideology. And as long as race remains in place, so will racism. As Thomas Chatterton Williams puts it, you can't actually defeat racism merely by opposing racism. You have to actually start opposing the categories of race if you want to transcend the hierarchies and caste systems they impose. I think that's a much harder task. However, does the fact that races don't exist as a scientific fact mean that they don't exist in any form? Consider this. In a purely biological sense, Obama was not the first black president. However, in social and historical terms, he is black, and that he shares a set of experiences of discrimination, oppression and resistance with those also defined as black. On the TV show 60 Minutes in 2007, Obama was asked by the presenter Steve Croft, yet at some point you decided that you were black? To which Obama replied, well, I'm not sure I decided it. I think if you look African-American in this society, you're treated as an African-American. As a person of mixed ancestry, Obama's black identity is a legacy of the racist one-drop rule of Jim Crow America. What Obama was saying here is that racial identity is often not a choice, but something that's imposed upon individuals. Here's another question. Just because race is a historical construct, does that mean it should be rejected entirely? Many would answer in the negative. African-American activists and intellectuals from W.E.B. Du Bois at the turn of the 20th century to ta Coates in this one have argued that even if race is a biological fiction, race as a form of historical identity can be a powerful weapon in the anti-racist arsenal, providing people of colour with a source of unity, identity and pride. As Coates put it, they made us a race, we made us a people. Du Bois' attempts to unite the African diaspora in the first half of the 20th century were not based on any idea of biological or even cultural affinity. Instead, they were based on the knowledge that people of African descent shared the same history of slavery and colonialism. Now, others, including the British Ghanaian philosopher Kwame Anthony Apaya, have argued that using race to defeat racism is paradoxical and self-defeating. But whoever you agree with, the debate itself is evidence of the power that racial ideology has to shape society and people's perception of that society. If we accept that race is an invention, the obvious question is, when was it invented? As you can imagine, this has been the source of much scholarly debate, complicated by the fact that historians always like to find the origins of things in their own period of study. When trying to find the root of racism, we need to bear in mind our definition of racism. The idea that humans can be divided into biological groups called races, that these groups determine culture and ability, and that these races can be arranged in a hierarchy. Obviously, there isn't enough time here to be comprehensive, but let's look at a few examples. Starting with the ancient world. These book titles give a fair indication of the type of debates that historians have. Benjamin Isaacs, The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity, 
and Frank Snowden before colour prejudice, the ancient view of blacks. So who's right? Well, scholars in the ancient world were certainly interested in skin colour. They viewed their own skin tones as normative and sought to explain divergence from this norm. There was much speculation about what caused the darker skin of sub-Saharan Africans. One explanation is reflected in the word Ethiopian, which is Greek for burnt by, for, by the sun. <clears throat> Moreover, the ancient Greeks certainly saw Africans as less attractive and less civilised than themselves. But they thought the same thing about the lighter skinned peoples of northern Europe, the Scythians. Most importantly, though, neither the Greeks nor the Romans developed discriminatory social structures built upon the idea of natural difference. Unlike, for instance, legislators in Jim Crow America, the Greeks never lost sight of the difference between physis, nature, and nomos, law or custom. There's plenty of evidence that sub-Saharan Africans enjoyed high levels of social and political assimilation in the Greek and Roman worlds. And although both were reliant upon slave labour, there was no connection between slavery and race. In other words, anybody could be enslaved. However, although an ideology of racism didn't exist in the ancient world, ideas about human difference did. And these ideas would later give power to and form a part of racial ideology. This is an important point. Ideologies don't appear from nowhere. They emerge when people recombine and reimagine extant notions in new ways. Let's take one example of this. In the ancient world, the colour black was used as a metaphor for evil, sin and death. This is known as colour symbolism. Colour symbolism predated racism and was most probably rooted in the contrast between night and day. However, it's easy to see how pre-existing associations of blackness with evil might shape perceptions of sub-Saharan Africans. The projection of the symbolic association of blackness onto dark skin began with the early Christians. In the writings of philosophers like the third century thinker Origen, pictured on the slide. Malcolm X was certainly aware of the consequences of colour symbolism. Indeed, in his autobiography, he recounts an incident in which a fellow prisoner opens a dictionary and shows him the definition of the world, the word black. This is an important step on the road to his political awakening. Moving on to the medieval world. <clears throat> There's a great deal of evidence to suggest that during the Middle Ages, Northern Europeans did not view Africans as naturally inferior. Let's look at a few non-racist portrayals of sub-Saharan Africans. Pictured on this slide is a statue built around 1250. It depicts the Christian Saint Maurice and can be found at Magdeburg Cathedral, beside the grave of Otto I, a Holy Roman Emperor. St Maurice had led a Roman legion and became a Christian martyr after he was executed for refusing to persecute Christians. Here is an image of the three magi, the wise men who visited Jesus in the stable. As you can see, one has sub-Saharan African features. This painting is an example of a European artistic tradition which began in the 11th century, in which one of the Magi is depicted as African. Here's another example. A couple of details from Hans Memling's The Last Judgment, a cheerful painting from the 1460s. This painting is particularly illustrative of the difference between colour symbolism and colour prejudice. As you can see, the demons taunting the sinners are depicted with black skin, but amongst the sinners is an African depicted with brown skin, paint, uh, placed on the same level with the European figures, even if this level is one of damnation. <coughs> All three of these examples demonstrate the way in which Christians incorporated Africans into their imagery as a shorthand for the universal reach of the Christian church. <clears throat>
The Christian God was the Lord of all the world and all humans were, according to Galatians, one in Jesus Christ. Indeed, as the historian Jan Pieters has argued, the 15th century was the African century, in which European enthusiasm for Africa peaked in response to perceived Islamic threat. These examples teach us a crucial lesson. History is not unchanging, nor is it an unbroken progress. In other words, it's inaccurate to say that Europeans have always been racist just as it's wrong to believe that attitudes have become less racist over time. The reality is much more complicated. So, when did racist ideology begin to cohere? Here we need to turn to 15th century Spain, remembering that race and skin colour are not the same thing. As George Fredrickson argues in your reading this week, ideas of natural difference accompanied by discriminatory social structures emerged as a result of the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain, which lasted several centuries, culminating in the 15th century. Christian control of the Iberian Peninsula was accompanied by growing suspicion of Jewish and Muslim converts to Christianity, or conversos. These conversos were seen as a potential threat to Christian states, harbouring secret loyalty to their original faiths. Consequently, ideas of innate or natural difference emerged to challenge older universalist Christian ideas. These ideas culminated in the notion of pure blood, a natural difference between pure Christians and impure converts. Importantly, these ideas were written into law in 1449 and in subsequent laws. Only purebloods could hold government or church positions. Moreover, the notion of pure blood reflects the fact that there weren't necessarily any outward indicators of racial difference. The earliest example of modern racism then had nothing to do with skin colour. This reminds us also that we should never forget the role played by anti-Semitism in the development of racial ideology. But to return to racism against people of African descent, when and why did anti-black racism emerge? In other words, when did ideas of sub-Saharan Africans as naturally inferior appear? To answer this question, we need to begin with the Islamic world. Medieval Islamic scholars paid far more attention to sub-Saharan Africans than European ones did. Let's look here at a couple of examples of Islamic discourse from the 11th and 15th centuries. If you pause the lecture now and read these two extracts. As you can see, negative ideas were beginning to cluster around sub-Saharan Africans, which certainly by the time of Ibn Khaldun seemed pretty close to racist notions of biological difference. Indeed, Khaldun's ideas are reminiscent of those of Edward Long, an English slaveholder who suggested in the late 18th century that his slaves were closer to great apes than humans. What explains such discourse? Well, the comparison to Edward Long is suggestive. It was in the Arabic world that associations between slavery and Africans first started to coalesce. Why was this? Well, initially, most slaves in the Islamic world were Christian prisoners of war. Arabic planters enslaved large numbers of European Christians during the Crusades, just as European Christians enslaved large numbers of Arabic Muslims. The enslavement of Christians was handy because the Quran prohibits the enslavement of fellow Muslims. However, sources of non-Muslim slaves dried up as the Islamic Caliphate swiftly unified the Arabian Peninsula, took control of North Africa and conquered Spain, as you can see on this map. Looking around for slaves, Arabic planters, growing staple crops like sugar, soon focused on sub-Saharan Africa. According to conservative estimates, between 700 CE and 1500 CE, around 4 million African slaves were transported to the Islamic world. Moreover, 
Whilst Christian slaves could be ransomed or exchanged for Muslim ones, African slaves were much less valuable, becoming associated with the most dangerous and degrading forms of work. As such, over time, the Arabic word for black, abd, became also the word for slave. However, Arabic prejudices against Africans never cohered into a systematic ideology as they did in the West. In Islamic society, ethnic ties never trumped religious affiliation. In other words, unlike Western societies, the Arab world never elevated biology above religion. So what happened in the West? As the example of Arabic slavery suggests, an increasing reliance on African slaves was instrumental to the development of racial ideology. The complete realisation of racist ideology would have to wait until European states developed a fully racialized system of slavery that has come to be labelled Atlantic slavery, and in which upwards of 12 million Africans were transported to the Caribbean and Americas. Now, there's evidence that slavery has existed in almost all societies at some point in time. But racial slavery didn't exist before the 1500s. Why was it then that Europeans came to depend so completely on African, specifically West African, labour? Well, in the 12th century, in the 1100s, Europeans began to establish plantations, growing cash crops like sugar, just like the plantations um, in the Arabic world. These plantations stretched across the Mediterranean from Palestine to the Canary Islands and were worked by slave labour, the most profitable form of labour by a country mile. At first, this system of slavery wasn't racial. European plantation owners used whomever they could get their hands on. In the early decades, a significant number of slaves came from the Slavic regions around the Black Sea. Indeed, the word slave has its origins in the word Slav. However, in the 15th century, a number of things happened at the same time which spelled disaster for West Africans. Firstly, the rise of the Ottoman Empire and its conquest of Constantinople in the east cut off the supply of Slavs. Then, soon after, Europeans discovered the New World, and found its climate perfect for growing cash crops. Initial attempts to use the indigenous people of the New World as slaves ended in disaster as a combination of European disease and exploitation decimated the indigenous populations. At the same time, roughly the same time, Europeans, making use of Chinese and Islamic innovations, developed the technology to sail to West Africa and back. Once they got to West Africa, Europeans discovered a pre-existing slave trade developed over the previous 800 years to provide labour to Arabic plantations. The key point is that Europeans were not motivated by an ideology of racism to enslave West Africans. They wanted to make money, as much money as possible and as easily as possible. Just as in the Arabic world, Europeans turned to African slaves when other sources dried up. As the historian and first president of Trinidad and Tobago, Eric Williams put it in 1944, slavery was not born of racism, rather racism was a consequence of slavery. In fact, even once Atlantic slavery had got going, it took a while for an ideology of race to appear. So when and why did Europeans decide that humans could be divided into biological categories determining their behaviour? Well, many historians of racism are agreed that it was sometime in the late 18th century. Racist ideology emerged in the late 1700s in response to two phenomena. Firstly, the new ideas of liberty and equality that emerged from the Enlightenment. 
From the beginning, it was clear to all that slavery flew in the face of natural rights. This paradox was felt especially keenly by the founding fathers of the United States, who'd spent the War of Independence complaining that the British sought to enslave them, all the while holding 700,000 of their own slaves. Thomas Jefferson, pictured the third American president, found the answer to this paradox of freedom and slavery in race. In his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, Jefferson dwelled at length on the biological differences between Euro-Americans and African-Americans. Here it's important to stop and emphasise that Jefferson was not simply responding to the racist tenor of his times. He was actually instrumental in the development of racial ideology. Indeed, Jefferson has been called the first American racial theorist. Crucially, Jefferson argued that biological differences, not only differences in religion and culture, would prevent Euro-Americans and freed slaves living together in peace in the same country. Freeing slaves without subsequently deporting them would, Jefferson insisted, result in race war. The second phenomenon which led to the development of racial ideology was the development of the natural sciences, which went hand in hand with the secularisation of the West. Whereas medieval theologians had thought humans a step below the angels, they were no longer, humans were no longer seen as separate from the animal kingdom. As a result, they were now seen as proper subjects for scientific study and categorisation. When the Swiss naturalist Carl Linnaeus invented the category Homo sapiens in 1758, he divided it up into four main categories, American, European, Asiatic and Africa. These categories clearly blurred nature and culture. Europeans, according to Linnaeus, were white, sanguine, muscular, hair, flowing, long, eyes blue, gentle, acute, inventive, covered with close-fitting vestments, governed by laws. Africans, on the other hand, were black, phlegmatic, indolent, hair black, frizzled, skin silky, nose flat, lips tuned, women without shame, mammy lactate profusely, crafty, lazy, negligent, anoints himself with grease, governed by caprice. From its inception, then, cultural prejudices were built into Western science. In categories coined by 18th century, scientists persist to this day. The first scientist to use the term race was Johann Blumenbach, who divided humans into five races, Mongolian, Malay, Ethiopian, American and Caucasian. He hit upon the label Caucasian after being sent a skull from the Caucasus mountain regions, which he thought particularly beautiful. Remembering that Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark was meant to have washed up, was found in the Caucasus mountain region, Blumenbach put two and two together and decided that the European race must have originated in the Caucasus. Whenever you see the category Caucasian on a form, you're looking at the result of one arbitrary decision made by an 18th century scientist. Racism is the perfect example of the way that ideology is both imposed from the top down and grows upwards out of extant social relations. Slave owners needed to justify exploitation of slaves in an age where, in an age of liberty, when ideas of social hierarchy were eroding. And the ways in which scientists saw the world and divided it up were conditioned by the reality of slavery and the various practices which set apart Euro-American slave owners from Afro-American slaves. The ideology of racism cohered in the late 18th century, becoming one of the dominant ideologies of the West. It's important to pause here to note that by the time racial ideology reached its high point or low point, racial slavery had existed for three centuries.
Clearly then, although they're intimately related, the ideology of racism is not quite the same thing as structural racism or the unequal distribution of power and resources along racial lines. As a system of ideas, racism does continue to exist, but it's changed in important ways over the course of the 20th century. Few politicians would now make an explicit claim to racial superiority. But as the Black Lives Matter movement has demonstrated, structural or systemic racism continues to blight the lives of people of colour, whether that means disproportionate levels of incarceration, police profiling and violence, unequal access to education, poverty or de facto segregation. We can talk about the contemporary world in the Q&A if you want. But for now, I want to talk about the 19th century, my research specialism, and a time in which racial ideology exerted massive power. It's perhaps no exaggeration to say that during the 19th century, racism was the official ideology of the West. There were a number of racisms why this ideology sharpened during the 19th century. Firstly, by the end of the 18th century, race and nation had fused in European thought. Increasingly, race, uh, nations were conceived in terms of ancestry rather than politics. This tendency was especially race. They presented a number of points of difference which indicate a distinct species. Now, as the records of Congress demonstrate, such views were by no means marginal. Across Western Europe and the United States, dehumanising representations of the, the quote-unquote Negro pervaded popular culture. In the late 1890s, King Leopold of Belgium imported 267 Congolese children, women and men to his country estate, where he set them up in a mock African village behind a fence. Similarly, in the US, visitors to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair could visit a mocked-up Dahomean village. Two years later, New York's Ambrose Park hosted an enormous exhibition entitled Black America. As the New York Times proclaimed, the magnitude of the affair may be understood when it is said the vast park occupied by Buffalo Bill's Wild West last season will be a plantation village with 150 cabins, gardens and cotton fields. Individuals also became famous as human attraction. 